Hello. Can anyone hear me? Good morning, Michael. Good morning. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Oh, good. I saw one sign on my mic suggesting it wasn't working, so I just wanted to be sure. Okay, it's good here. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. We're just waiting for um, the session to begin formally at midday. Then okay. we shall, yes, we shall roll out. Yes. Good.
Hi, good afternoon, Wandi. Good morning, good afternoon. Good, uh, good morning, good afternoon. Good. We're going to go ahead and start now. Yes. Good morning and good afternoon. Welcome to another session of Nutrition Conversations Africa. My name is Yewande Kazim, CEO of Wandiville Media, and I'm pleased to be moderating today's session with my colleague from GAIN, Grace Duo. On behalf of Wandiville, Wandiville Media and GAIN, thank you for joining us today. At Wandiville, one of our main objectives is to create awareness and demand for nutritious foods, impart knowledge through advocacy support, and call to action on the challenges in the agricultural and nutritional landscape in Africa. The goal for us will be a day or a time where Africa is not associated with malnutrition. Nutrition Conversation Africa, NC Africa like they like to call it, is an advocacy platform aimed at eliminating African nutrition challenges and opportunities, transformative ideas and game-changing solutions through continuous conversations, call to action, advocacy support and engagement to curb malnutrition in Africa. Today, we're excited to discuss the way forward after the UN Food System Summit and what it means to Africa. The summit has made us dig deep in transforming our food systems, but most importantly, focus on the solutions to solve malnutrition challenges and hopefully shifts in attitudes on how we grow, process, trade, and consume our food. To that end, we encourage active audience participation Please add your comments and questions throughout the session into the Q&A box. There'll be opportunities to address your questions and engage in the discussion during the moderated Q&A sessions. To begin, with the, to begin the program, I'm pleased to introduce and welcome Grace Duo, Communications Manager, Country Programs at GAIN. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wendy. And to everybody who is here today, our speakers and our guests, Welcome to this edition of Nutrition Conversations Africa. It is great to have you join us. Uh, Gain's vision is a world without malnutrition in which all people have access to and consume nutritious and safe food, especially to the most vulnerable to malnutrition. And as Alia mentioned by Wendy, it is our desire that by uh, bringing this conversation closer home, this nutrition conversation, we can similarly rally much needed local action around nutrition and improved food systems. So we're very excited to be able to have this discussion soon after the United Nations Food Summit. And as you all know, this has been a historic year of action on nutrition. And the summit uh, especially has been a culmination of eight months of work that has laid the foundation for global food systems transformation. So in our discussion today, we will be highlighting this journey through GAIN's policy advisors experiences and the opportunities that are now before us all under the Africa lens. And I would also like to mention that uh, it is a practice for Nutrition Conversations Africa to bring on board diverse voices on the platform, because that is also GAIN's norm in how we work with partners. Uh, but for this edition, uh, GAIN policy advisors having led and or partnered uh, on multi-stakeholder engagements in their respective countries, they aptly bring together these voices from the field. So without much ado, I would like to begin the session by introducing the first speaker, who is Dr. Michael Ojo. Dr. Ojo is a very experienced professional and he has extensive senior management and leadership expertise, which has gained from a variety of assignments across London over 20 years. And uh, more recently with international, within international trade and development in West Africa. Previously, he was a country director for Water Aid in Nigeria, and uh, he joined uh, GAIN in 2017, where he's leading the Nigeria country office in a similar capacity. So in Nigeria, Dr. Ojo is focused on making healthier food choices, uh, more affordable, more available, and more desirable, including work to scale up business investments in nutritious food value chains, to reduce post-harvest losses, secure better diets for children, and progress food fortification at scale. So we are very happy to have Dr. Ojo with us today, and I welcome you to give your opening remarks. Thank you very much, um, Wandi and Grace. Um, thank you for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to be able to join this um, second edition of the Nutrition Conversations Africa, uh, focusing on outcomes from the 2021 UN Food Systems Summit, what it means for Africa's nutrition stability. So the People's Summit has come and gone, uh, but in many ways, uh, it's, the work is only really just beginning. Um, as Grace said, for eight months this year, 
Nigeria alongside more than 130 other countries across the globe took time to reflect on the state of our food systems, to understand why so many people are still going to bed hungry every day, and to walk through in a collective, inclusive and multi-stakeholder way what we must do as countries and as a global community to cost correct towards the attainment of the sustainable development goals that we've all agreed are critical for the sustainability and prosperity of all of us as a people and the planet that we occupy. Given the worrying numbers of people malnourished and suffering micronutrient deficiencies globally and in all of our focal countries, and which has been made even worse by COVID and climate impacts, meaning nearly 20% more people are going to bed hungry in 2020, uh, globally compared with 2019, that rises actually 50% more in West Africa over the same period. It was clear that a new urgency had to be generated around hunger and malnutrition. So the summit in the way it galvanized action at national and global levels has done exactly that and more. More in the sense that it has opened our eyes and minds to the multiple implications that the way that our food systems work have for not just how much nutritious food is available and consumed, but also for the impact that food systems have on our climate and environmental sustainability, on livelihoods and jobs, and on the future and fortunes of women, young people, and indigenous peoples, that we cannot afford to face just one way, but that we ensure building the capacity, resilience, and relevance of our food systems must deliver not just human health, but also planetary health, as well as equity and justice. Now, I'm really proud of the role that GAME, the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition, has played in this process. We saw early on that this was beyond business as usual. And so we engaged in a way to enable us to contribute to and influence the outcome. Our executive director, Dr. Lawrence Haddad, was asked to chair one of the five action tracks. And in the countries where we work, and even beyond, we put ourselves forward to be a resource to the country systems, contributing our knowledge, our expertise, to help make the process robust and the outputs reflective of the wishes of the peoples and governments of the countries that we support. And to trans translate this into game-changing solutions that will deliver fundamental reforms in the way that our food systems are, are set up in the short, medium and longer term. Again, as an organization took a strategic decision about five years ago to focus our energies on transforming food systems so that they deliver nutrition safe foods in the required quantities and at affordable prices to ensure that we all, especially those most vulnerable to malnutrition, have access to healthy diets. We know that diets are the root of all forms of malnutrition and that in countries like Nigeria, unhealthy diets are the drivers of five or perhaps even up to six of the top 10 causes of disability and death in our populations. So what did we find in Nigeria from the 40 or so dialogues that brought together well over 4,000 participants overall? We found that we were largely blind in regard to how our food systems worked from national to sub-national and even to community levels. We saw and were reminded of the outcomes of this flawed system, that hunger has continued to rise in Nigeria with the most recent data classifying 44% of Nigerians as moderately to severely food insecure. That, ladies and gentlemen, is roughly 90 million people. And I will let that sink in. That's the population of a number of countries put together. And this assessment was before COVID actually struck. We were reminded that over a third of our children are stunted and that less than 10% of Nigerians can afford a healthy diet that provides all of the recommended food groups including fresh fruits and vegetables. Furthermore, that the way that we farm, fish and graze our livestock has lowered yields, severely depleted our soils, made us more vulnerable to erosion, led to the loss of habitats and biodiversity, facilitated the loss and waste of 10% of all of the food production on average. In some value chains, this could be actually as high as 40%. And as men, the households with, with, uh, with food systems related livelihoods, remain some of the most chronically poor and vulnerable to stresses and shocks amongst our populations. So you can imagine uh, that we had a lot of dialoguing to do. 
And after six months of engagement led by the national convener appointed by the government, stakeholders in the country outlined a long list of recommendations, which have been summarized into six solution clusters to chart a pathway for food uh, systems transformation across all of the five action tracks uh, in Nigeria over the short and long term. These six clusters are further summarized uh, by me. This are my summaries as follows. Number one, investing in data, information, knowledge, and skills development for food and nutrition security. Two, building sustainability, resilience, and res responsiveness and inclusivity into our food systems. Three, developing our priority value chains and markets for increased productivity and enhanced livelihoods. Four, increasing demand for and consumption of nutritious safe foods delivered through markets and through social protection schemes. Five, promoting peace building, environmental awareness and resilience, as well as the wider enabling environment for food systems to work. And finally, linking research, innovation, extension systems, et cetera, in public private partnerships for food system sustainability. There may be a chance and there will be a chance to dive a little bit deeper into some of these clusters and components in the course of our conversation today. However, I want to end by focusing on the big shifts that all of the work building up to the UNFSS has produced. And perhaps one of the most significant outcomes is the multiple new cross-sector conversations and initiatives and pledges of financial and technical investment and support that the summit has triggered. So we have, we've seen the birth of Act for Food, Act for Change, a youth-led campaign for action on food systems transformation. We've seen the coalition of action for healthy diets from sustainable food systems for children and all, which includes the significant set of initiatives on food safety. We've seen this zero hunger private sector pledge, which brings significant new funding to food systems. We've seen an alliance for anemia actions and wasting research focusing on specific actions to reverse th these symptoms through dietary improvements, through women's empowerment and other interventions. We've seen the Global Food 50-50, a gender and food systems accountability initiative. And lastly, um, just on the list that I've put together, a, a um, 50 million US dollar gain in COFIN nutritious food financing facility to support SMEs providing healthy foods. It's exciting, and I mean, again, we've seen an exciting new funder for the facility. Uh, this is the, U, uh, the US government, part of a 5 billion announcement over five years to build uh, more financing into the future. For gain, in addition to the launch of this uh, financing facility, we are committing to investing a minimum of 250 million over the next five years to support implementation in national food systems transformation pathways and to support the identify priority actions. Where we work in countries like Bangladesh, Ethiopia, India, Indonesia, Kenya, Mozambique, Nigeria, Pakistan, and Tanzania, working through and with the national, state, and local governments and their systems, and with, with a wide array of partners. We are also committed to expanding our boundaries to work with new organizations in the spirit of the connectedness that I spoke about between the issues of hunger, health, climate change, environment, and livelihoods. So that means we'll be working with more new actors, with new government departments, with new businesses, and many more. So to wrap up, I want to leave you all with one thought. And this is a perspective that was shared with me by a respected colleague last week, which I think is really important to share, as I believe some of our audience today are the, um, the micro, small, and medium enterprises that will drive all of these transformations that we've been talking about. So we've done a lot of talking. It is now time for doing. All these promises and pledges and the new energy means significant new investments. So my charge to you all is to get ready or others will position themselves and take advantage of this new investment. There's lots of money, lots of new thinking on the table. We in Africa, have the capacity in our respective countries to do what needs to be done. The change should be made by us, not for us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Ojo. So well articulated. Indeed, we as Africans, we have 
to take action now. Um, we have the answers, we have the know-how, we have it all here within the continent. And it is a platform such as this where we are able to bring to forth these ideas and see how to then best move forward. I think one of the, the, the key things that you have highlighted, uh, especially is the multi-step sectoral multi-stakeholder engagements and initiatives and commitments and bringing together what we are calling at again the unusual suspects. Um, so it is time indeed to take to take action. So thank you so much for your comments. Um, and uh, we will get into our panel session and I will invite my colleague Wendy to take us through that session before we take your uh, questions and answers. Please remember to continue putting them in the chat. We shall address them towards uh, the end of the webinar. Thank you. Over to you, Wendy. Thank you, thank you, Grace. Um, and I'd like to add to what um, Dr. Ojo said, very inspiring. I like the fact that he said the change must be made by us, not for us. And that is what Nutrition Conversation Africa is about. So thank you for that. As mentioned earlier, in today's session, we'll be discussing the way forward after the UN Food Systems Summit, what it means for Africa, nutrition stability. And joining us today are five distinguished panelists Please continue to put your questions in the Q&A box. I see one question. So please continue to add questions to it. I would like to begin the discussion with Mr. Obi, Obey Inkia. He's a senior advisor, food system transformation for GAIN Tanzania. Obey, Obey Inkia is an experienced trained economist. For the past 18 years, he has worked with the government of Tanzania in the areas of budget forecast, budget process, public expenditure review, coordinating government through reading reports and providing technical inputs. He has been involved in social and economic impact studies and assessments, research program design and evaluation. Welcome, Mr. Obe. Are you with us this morning? Oh, thank you very much uh, for this uh, uh, invitation and to be in this uh, panel. Um, I think really, um, thank you, uh, Michael, for a very good introduction, really to say, yeah, a lot has happened because we, you could see this uh, food uh, system dialogues in the country in three phases, pre-summit phase where the countries really, we engaged in a very um, good uh, discussions to come out with issues which are necessary for moving forward during the summit, we had a lot of commitment, a lot of good things coming, but the most important thing, what happened after the summit to, to, to those things, which the stakeholders uh, came up with, because this is the people's, uh, like you said, is the people's uh, initiatives. So- Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ms. Obey, yes, thank you. I, I don't, I'm trying to see, I don't see you, so we would like to see your face oh. on the camera. Is but, it? Uh, um, <laughs> yes. But I wanted to ask you, what is the aim of the summit? The aim of the summit has been to rally government to prioritize malnutrition for sustainable gains. How would you rate Africa's uptake of Africa's involvement in the summit? Sorry, I was trying to uh, put the video. Oh, okay. Did you get it? Mm -hmm. Okay, no, I'll okay. take that again. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. The aim of the summit has been to rally government to prioritize malnutrition for sustainable gains. How would you rate Africa's uptake or involvement in this? Yeah, I think to me, uh, Africa um, uh, has been well involved, uh, uh, not only during this summit, but there's been a big commitment in African countries to tackle malnutrition. But also it, during this, uh, um, uh, this uh, process of, uh, of dialogues, we saw a lot of uh, dialogues within the African uh, um, context to try to come out with solutions to reduce the rate of malnutrition, which are still very high. We also see the participants participation of a lot of uh, government leaders in the, uh, in the summit itself and offering some good commitments for, 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 for moving forward. So I see Africa uh, really um, did what is supposed to be done, although more could be done. And I think to me, uh, the post summit um, uh, would be important in trying to make Africa uh, government to be more involved and make really uh, utilize of this momentum with the global momentum to uh, end 
uh, malnutrition or to reduce it is really at a higher rate than is being done today. So I see the future as promising and the government taking lead in all this. Thank you, Mr. Obi. I think the goal for us is to rally more African governments to prioritize nutrition, which is very critical for this part of the continent. Thank you very much. To build on the conversation, I'd like to introduce Ms. Asa Zewid, Zewdi, sorry. She's a senior, senior policy advisor for Gain Ethiopia. She has vast experience in program management, policy advocacy, strategic development, climate finance, and private sector development. Prior to GAIN, Asa worked as a program lead at the International Finance Corporation, IFC. Asa has worked on several projects promoting sustainable markets, development practice, and customized solutions to poverty. Ms. Esther, are you with us this morning? Yes, good morning, or oh, good afternoon in your side. What are some of the key opportunities that have come out of the summit for the African continent? Thank you, Andy and Grace, and uh, good afternoon, uh, good morning, everyone. I'm pleased to be part of this conversation. Um, the summit has brought great opportunities um, for, for countries, uh, it brought together the countries and global community priorities and commitments towards transforming the food system to address malnutrition and uh, food security in, the, in general. Um, as food security and malnutrition are main challenges, especially in Africa, the commitment to support uh, large scale food fortification, product diversification, to reduce post harvest loss, food safety, climate smart, uh, agriculture, uh, healthy diets, and food security and uh, risk management, and also in the engagement of the private sector are huge opportunities that have come from the summit. Um, even in preparation for the summit, key stakeholders, including policymakers, private sector, civil society donors, all were engaged in identifying major challenges and possible uh, game changers and developed roadmaps, uh, considering multi-sector approach to transform the broken food system, which is quite uh, useful. So it will enable policymakers to make informed policy decisions to address uh, food security and malnutrition in a sustainable manner. Uh, private sector players to see the business case or opportunities in engaging in a nutritious diet related businesses and development partners and civil society to align their support with the country's uh, food system transformation priorities and roadmap. Uh, this uh, whole process is also at, in line with uh, gain values, which is very uh, interesting to address malnutrition. And it also helps to bring different uh, similar uh, like-minded stakeholders to work, to, work, to work together towards uh, healthy diets. Uh, so, and the very interesting thing, uh, also an opportunity was the entire process was supported by not only gain, you know, policy advisors or uh, policy related uh, people, but the, the whole gain top leaders were engaged in this entire process, which was uh, very uh, important. Thank you, Ms. Zudi. Thank you. I like the fact that we talked more about the solutions for these challenges, but it also means opportunities for the stakeholders and the small businesses for them to um, tap, tap into this um, opportunity. Thank you very much for that. For the next question, I'd like to introduce Ms. Joyce Akpata. She's the head of policy and advocacy at Gain Nigeria. In this role, she leads Gain Nigeria's wider, wider influencing agenda and is responsible for ensuring that the interventions led by Gain and its, and its different partners are coordinated so that overall project and policy goals are met. Prior to this, she was appointed the Director General for the Nigerian British Chamber of Commerce, in which she had, in which she had the responsibility for turning around the chamber positively. Mr. Pata, welcome this morning. Thank you very much, uh, Wandi, and it's good to be here. 
Thank you for being here. Countries are developing food systems transformation pathways. What do these do? Example, prioritize activities to undertake urgently in the next five years. What, what exactly does this mean for African countries? How are we doing this? All right, uh, so the food system transformation pathways are essentially uh, a route to developing sustainable food systems that links the focus on food with achievements of the uh, SDGs by 2030. I think this uh, underscores the critical role that uh, the food systems play and its cross-cutting nature in the global development agenda. Indeed, uh, an effective and uh, sustainable and resilient food system has a tremendous impact on a nation because aside from uh, ensuring food security and eradicating hunger, it can also create jobs and uplift the economic well-being of a population, thereby improving the nation's uh, economy. So uh, the Food System Summit, by tasking countries to draw up these uh, transformation pathways, has provided an opportunity for um, coordinated and all-inclusive actions, you know, weaving together multiple interests and perspective from various uh, stakeholders and constituencies. As was mentioned by previous speakers, we had participation from government, private sector, donors, youth, civil society, ac academia, businesses and all. And uh, the various dialogues, pre-summit dialogues, provided an, an opportunity for all the stakeholders to make relevant contributions addressing their specific concerns. And uh, as people and organizations come together through this uh, interdisciplinary approach to explore the nature of the food systems in their various countries and to develop these transformation uh, pathways, they gain a collective sense of uh, importance of working together to ensure they have a more sustainable future by developing pathways that weave together policies with the ownership and commitment to participation from a wide range of actors. So we see uh, that the transformative pathways are expected to serve as a, a roadmap for nations towards achievement of uh, their short and long-term priorities, drawing out the key elements of the food systems, which would be required to change and evolve over the next uh, five to 10 years and indeed beyond. Uh, I think the pathways also provide uh, invaluable information about how best to focus and uh, deliver interventions in the various uh, food systems of these countries. And looking at the pathways that have been developed by, by a few of the countries, we, we can see that uh, they contain a holistic and uh, content specific goals to drive the identified priorities of these countries. And uh, in doing so, a lot of the countries have taken into consideration their local circumstances. And most of the, the, the pathways broadly reflect the emerging uh, themes of the summit and indeed the 2030 agenda. And uh, I think Dr. Audrey had listed a few of these in his uh, uh, welcome remarks earlier. You know, we're looking at people addressing issues around uh, food access and affordability. We're looking at uh, the planet, considering issues around sustainability and resilience. We're looking at things around peace and stability, partnerships, governance indeed, which is very important because if you don't have a, a governance framework, the commitments from government required to, to implement these pathways would not be, be there. So that's very, very critical. Of course, how we can leverage on knowledge and innovation as well to drive uh, and inform policy and uh, ad adaptation and adoption of uh, new technology across the food uh, system. So the pathway is basically with support nations to review um, unsustainable practices and also sustain or support sustainable ones, you know, thereby strengthening uh, governance of the food systems. Also in facilitating uh, uh, peer learning and evidence-based uh, decision-making, thereby uh, shaping and maintaining uh, these pathways to ensure that uh, uh, over time, they are seen as an evolving task, 
you know, that will continue long after the food uh, system summit. I believe uh, that to achieve the aspirations of these countries as con contained in these uh, pathways, it's very, very key that government will have to then integrate the pathways into their planning and uh, make relevant budgetary allocations to guarantee implementation. Because it's one thing to have these documents and it's another thing to ensure that uh, they are implemented to achieve the desired result. It's very important that at this point, government will see how best they can utilize existing uh, institutions and uh, mechanisms you know, by improving their responsiveness to these priorities that have been identified in the various pathways. It's important at this point that, uh, you know, with all the momentum that has been built up pre-summit, you know, and on this journey, we would encourage or need to see government finding ways and means of sustaining these uh, uh, momentum to ensure that uh, we achieve the 2030 agenda and indeed uh, improve our food systems. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pata. Thank you. There, there are obviously clear opportunities for involvement and sustainability is key. So conversations with action. Thank yes. you very much. Now I'd like to introduce Mr. Charles Opio. He's the policy and influencing manager for Game Kenya. Mr. Opio is a food system specialist and he currently plays an advisory role on all, on all matters policy relating to food and nutrition security in Kenya. He's currently the policy lead on the UN Food Systems Plan and Nutrition for Good Activities on behalf of GAIN in Kenya. Mr. Obira, good afternoon. How are you doing today? Are you with us? I don't see him. No, I'm here. Mr. Obira. oh, good afternoon. <laughs> thank you. Yes, thank what you very much, Bendy. What do you hope the legacy of this summit will, will be? What do you want the African continent to take from this? What's the legacy for this, from the summit? Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Um, as you mentioned, it's been a very long and quite engaging process as since the discussion around the UN Food System Summit began. And basically, as African con I mean, countries, basically, I think been very much uh, involved in the process of engaging with this process. So I would say that a number of things actually uh, rather have come up, which I think would be an opportunity for Africa to carry forward. Uh, one is the fact that we appreciate that for the first time this was a people summit where a lot of people have been excluded, especially in food systems programs, looking at policy making process, had an opportunity to be able to engage and to hear, get their voices heard. And that means that it really has set a new uh, template for African countries to look at our food systems process as a very holistic and multi-sectoral in nature, where you know women, young people, the smallholder farmers, you know people with lived experiences having an opportunity to really express their views, and that is what uh, this particular summit has presented. And we believe that would be something that would carry as a legacy that uh, some of these commitments are not just appreciated for the very high-level government officials, but even the very very uh, local farmer should be able to have an opportunity to really uh, carry this forward. Again, we're looking at uh, the kind of investment commitments that have come from you know, various member states, but also from the development partners, uh, which to me was a big, a big deal for, for Africa, especially looking at, uh, or rather maybe I would say, uh, generally looking at issues in terms of uh, people and planet. Uh, you look at even, for instance, when you look at uh, what Gates, uh, I mean, Gates Foundation has committed in terms of 922 million uh, additional commitments towards nutrition, is not just an achievement because this is one of the, you know, one of the most uh, significant cut of commitment they have made in this particular area. And therefore, as a continent, I think looking at the challenges we are facing even at the moment, especially now brought in with the COVID, the ever increasing number, of, I mean, the population size, climate change issues, compounding the whole process, it is an opportunity for us to be able to really tap into these particular resources that have been made available by, you know, different governments uh, to be able to transform our food systems. And of course, I would also want to reiterate the fact that Africa Development Bank has already projected that close to 23 million Africans are likely to be pushed into extreme poverty in the next couple of years if something is not done ardently. Uh, that is also linked to a close to another 20 million jobs that are likely to be lost. So this is because we have a number of things that we are facing as a continent, but I think with this kind of increased investments, then the new thinking that has come from the Food System Summit should be an opportunity to rescue and to be able to really uh, refocus and look at our, our 
our policies, look at our implementation plans and the pathways that have actually we have committed to uh, as member states to be able to ensure that uh, we, we, we we save the situation, not just uh, for, for, for people, but also looking at the, the planetary uh, commitments that we've made even through the various commitments that we've had before. So I'm looking at this as an opportunity uh, in terms of issues of research and data that came out very much. In fact, the role of science in terms of informing our decision making is, is something that I think African countries need to learn very effectively to really go back to what is workable. If you're talking about nutrition, what is it that is available within our continent that we might want to go to? And that means that even looking at the, you know, the, the forgotten or indigenous uh, uh, and nutritious foods that uh, a lot of the times have not been able to really gain you know, our attention, we can now go back and look at what is it that we can be able to do, including looking at what I call uh, low cost but high impact interventions like food fortification, looking at biofortification and emerging you know, opportunities to be able to address issues in terms of micronutrient deficiency and also the other forms of malnutrition that we are currently facing. So it's a big deal for us and just not just the people, but also for the planet, because for the first time, there's a bit more of integration looking at the five action tracks that were laid out uh, at, at the onset, which, which has really informed the conversation right from where we started and where we hope now with the pathways, we can easily get to uh, really um, achieve this, the, the, the agenda 2030 that we so desire. So basically, that's the brief, uh, brief I want to say, uh, that we have opportunities in that space. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Opio. Thank you. Yeah. I know I like, we talked about the challenges, we talked about the solutions, yeah. and you know, everything seems um, like a lot. But I like that you talked about what is workable, what is more realistic, and how can we go about it? What can it be done? We have a diverse group of policy influencers in the nutrition space on this webinar. And when looking at time, we pretty much have four minutes before we get into the Q&A session. I want to throw out a question to everybody on the panel. And please, let's just wrap it up in 30 seconds so that we have time for the Q&A session. Give us one top nutrition priority and priority. What is the top nutrition priority for African countries to focus on the way forward after the UN Food System Summit? Just one word. We'll start with you, Mr. Pierce, since you're still on. What is the one thing that it's key for African continent to focus on in 30 seconds? Thank you. I would say that uh, looking at the African common position in terms of the critical pillar is to focus and invest on nutrition-centered food policies that are really uh, very very affordable, very available, and the homegrown food, looking at school feeding interventions, any very basic opportunity that we can uh, get to provide food to people, let it be nutritious. So I think in that case, we'll be able to really significantly reduce the cost uh, that comes in with the you know, issues to do with malnutrition. So I think looking into that, uh, in terms of high impact, but low cost solutions that are made available within the continent. That is where we need to put our, our, our resources and policy to, to look at. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. And I'll go to Dr. Ojo. Dr. Ojo. Can you please repeat the question? I'm, I was typing in the response okay. to one of the so, Q and A's. So in, yeah. in, in 30 seconds, what is the top nutrition priority for African government to focus on? Just one out of the top one. I think we, the, the top one for me really is that we, we need to focus uh, for food systems on the, the way that our value chains work. And, you know, that answer encompasses a lot of different things. Um, a lot of the problems that we face is because um, the value chains are not adequately supported. The supply chains, sorry, are not adequately supported. So, um, you know, the, the demand is not there for nutritious foods. The production systems are not set up properly. Logistics are not efficient. Uh, the, the little food we produce, a lot of it is wasted. And so if we get the supply chains um, working supported, that needs big infrastructure, uh, roads, cooling, etc. That's a big one. Thank you. And I'd like to add one more question to it. What is um, your favorite local indigenous food? And everybody has to answer that. We still have a little bit of time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, it's, it's become a bit uh, international now. I, I, I like uh, fried plantain. It's not very healthy because, um, <laughs> you know, you have to, you know, you deep fry it. But I, 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 I enjoy it. So that's, um, that's my favorite one, apart from meat, of course. <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you. So I'll go to Mr. Inkia, Obey Inkia. 
Okay, uh, no, thank you very much. I think to me, really, I'm looking at the interventions, which looks at the uh, production, consumption, and reaching the table, the nutrient, nutrient dense food. So using the sensitive interventions like agriculture, like biofortification and fortification to me becomes important in reaching many people in an integrated way along the value chain. Uh, that, that to me will work fast because you don't change life of the farmers. They, they continue the production of the maize they are used to, beans they are used to, but they are more nutrient dense. Thank you. And what's your favorite local indigenous nutritious food? It is fortified uh, maize, um, PVA maize, ugali. If you know ugali, ugali is a, a stiff porridge. Yeah, thank you. I know, I know ugali. But <laughs> thank fortified, you. bio fortified. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I'll, I'll move, the next question is for Ms. Ms. Zudi. The same question, sorry. Yes. Uh, so, okay. Yes. Yeah. Thanks. So, uh, large scale, large scale food fortification is a, a can come up at the top because um, it can uh, you know address many of the the people needs in a very cost effective manner and it's a proven way in, in different countries as well. So, uh, fortifying staple foods. Uh, will be the very critical and important element to be considered. Thank you. And your favorite indigenous food? Um, yeah, definitely. It's injera, it's Ethiopian favorite, you know, uh, yeah, food. Uh, yeah, so fortifying those uh, staple foods will be very critical in, you know, changing the dynamics. Thank you. That's something I have to try. I've never tried that. Thank you. <laughs> you should. <laughs> And I'll go to Ms. Akpata, same question. Thank you. You're muted, sorry. Yeah, I just realized I was muted. <laughs> so in addition to what others have said, I think key it's uh, for us as uh, African nations to see how best we can uh, expand and improve on our social protection uh, programs, you know, and look at uh, situations whereby we're able to create uh, food banks that deliver healthy and uh, safe and nutritious uh, food to poor communities, especially in uh, humanitarian uh, emergencies. Uh, it's also critical for me to see that uh, we scale up uh, um, food preservation and home storage, you know, uh, uh, processing to see how best we can minimize food wastage and uh, build up households to ensure they have uh, uh, adequate food stock you know, for season. And uh, in terms of my local, I don't know if beans is, is, is considered a local delicacy now, but I think uh, beans, maybe we'll now start thinking of iron fortified beans, you know? Yeah, yeah beans and you. noodles. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Thanks to all the discussions and um, to your, uh, for the insights and perspective. It was an, it was actually interesting learning about people's different food, um, food local indigenous food. I'll let Grace take over from here as we transition into the Q and A session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wendy. And as you say, that has been a very informative discussion. I think uh, I feel one of the most important things that has come out from this is that we are able to break down what the UN food system some means in 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 um you know understandable and accessible uh, language and content so thank you so much to each one of you for that i see a couple of questions on the chat box and already some are being answered but so i think i will first give caleb uh, his hand has been up for quite a while maybe the opportunity to um ask his question caleb if you can hear me you can unmute and ask your question caleb Bale. Okay. Go, go ahead, Caleb. All right. While he's sorting that out, I see another hand from um, Musibau Aziz. You can proceed then to ask your question. Maybe your microphones are muted. We can't uh, seem to hear those whose hands are up. Uh, so I maybe suggest you put your questions in the chat box. Um, let me give Professor Kala an opportunity. 
to ask his question or has, sorry. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Professor Kala. Such a, such a great privilege to be here. And uh, thank you, Nutritious Africa, you know, uh, for what you're doing and gain. Uh, it's such an excellent uh, initiative to bring all key stakeholders together to look at, um, you know, uh, what common future we can build together. And I like, you know, the emphasis that has been raised, you know, that um, together we can raise, you know, Africa that is free from malnutrition together, you know, not for us, you know, but with us and, um, you know, looking at our own common goals. I would like to see, you know, uh, coming from the point of view of academia, you know, what role uh, with your organization and GAIN Africa has in, in area of capacity building, um, particularly from the universities and uh, other institutions and in the areas of also research and development, because if we must produce dense foods or high quality nutritious food, then, you know, they, uh, we cannot underplay, you know, the role of research and development. And in practical terms, you know, how are we going to engage, you know, um, the, the university communities, you know, um, in the various countries, Ethiopia, you know, Kenya, Nigeria, and other places, and, you know, um, to see that we look at both the indigenous foods that might be nutritious, that needs a little push, that might be culturally very much acceptable, and, you know, to introducing also new value chains along the line so that, you know, we, uh, we have a win-win situation. So it is in this respect that I feel that uh, maybe any of the, either Dr. Ojo or any of the speakers could address my situations and what future engagements, you know, uh, um, academ academics like me could, could contribute, you know, to this conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kala. Uh, Dr. Ojo, you want to take it? Yeah, thank you very much, um, uh, Professor Kala. I, I, I think it's a really, really good point. One of the reasons I think that is because I, the Nutrition Society of Nigeria's annual conference, uh, which happened last week in Nigeria, and we were talking about food systems. And one of the things that it, it has become clear to me is that the conversation on food systems has actually raised the profile of nutrition and you know, all the other um, academic disciplines that are connected to food. And that's important because um, it would seem to me that a lot of people were not, um, what's the right word? We're not um, proud of being within, within the nutrition of food sector. And so they finish from university and try to get into other lines of work. But now there's a big emphasis on food, on food systems, on nutrition. And that's really important for just building uh, confidence amongst those who are studying these uh, programs. But in the Nigeria context, the conversations that we had, the very first set of solution clusters actually has quite a lot of emphasis on um, nutrition education, uh, through curricular um, development and uh, revisions at primary school, secondary school, and also a, a different way of actually positioning tertiary institutions. One thing that I, I would ask you, um, excuse me, <clears throat> from the university sector to do is to really build the capacity to be um, key players in this process, um, you know, to be consultants, to be uh, knowledge partners to do those things that we end up um, having international consultancies and so do because the capacity is there. Speaking to you know people in the in the field in universities, I know the capacity is there, but there isn't that entrepreneurial um, you know uh, spirit or way of working, and that really needs to be developed so that you can also take advantage of all of these new investments coming into the nutrition uh, and food system space. Thank you, Dr. Ojo. I will, thank you. I will, I will uh, raise Caleb's question because he's, he had raised his hand a while back and his, but his mic was not uh, audible. I think this is with regards to what uh, um, Ms. Pata had mentioned about the meal kits. And uh, Caleb is asking, how does GAIN intend to support local startups in Africa that help Africans have access and achieve healthy nutrition lifestyles by, by providing meal kits tailored to their needs? Isaac Butter? Sorry, I didn't quite catch the last bit of your question, Grace. 
the question is, how does GAIN uh, intend, intend to support local startups in Africa uh, that help African nutrition lifestyles by providing meal kits that are tailored to their needs? Okay, uh, in terms of uh, supporting uh, startups, uh, we have what we call the Scaling Up Nutrition Network, the SBN Network, which basically focuses on working with uh, newtrepreneurs and uh, businesses with to build capacity and uh, expand their reach. Indeed, uh, like various conversations we've had, we've seen the importance of uh, SMEs and how they contribute within the sector. And for a large number of uh, companies within the agricultural and nutrition space, we have realized that uh, a lot of SMEs play in this space. So we come up with uh, various uh, capacity producing the various uh, food uh, products. They opt for the uh, uh, biofortified uh, varieties or fortified varieties, you know, that we were able to address uh, issues of uh, uh, malnutrition and, and hunger within uh, the space, you know, utilizing products from these uh, uh, small and medium-sized businesses. Thank you for that. Um, there's a question for Mr. Opio on, about uh, young people and uh, system transformation agenda. Charles, over to you. Sorry, I don't know whether I missed that bit you are talking about. The there's a question. Yes, there's a question that is uh, addressed to you that is asking how, uh, that is bringing in the angle on about youth and youth engagement oh yeah yeah, yeah great. How, how can we continue to engage them moving forward africa's food system transformation agenda great uh, um I, I think that that's one thing that uh, we have to very much emphasize because basically as you look at the demographic even in this particular continent we know very well that uh, it's a very young population a, a young kind of uh uh, having a young population. So that means that we really have to really give the young people the space, support them, provide opportunities and see how we can engage them very meaningfully. So I believe uh, uh, the, 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 the movement about Act for Food, Act for Change is something that uh, should be you know, supported. And uh, I think opportunities like in the learning institutions are looking at what Kenya has just committed from the UN Food Systems Summit, and in terms of the reviving, you know, the, 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 the role of young people, looking at the 4K clubs and all these things in learning institutions, it means that already they're being repositioned and given an uh, opportunity to be able to really, really drive the agenda effectively. So I think just looking at what commitments you have made in different countries, and I believe looking at even the common pillar within the African common positions, you'll definitely realize that young people, uh, or rather the role of youth is, is also given the center stage. And that's what I would want to say, that look at those opportunities to be able to really continue engaging with a lot of young people uh, who may have not really had a chance, especially to really have uh, participated effectively in this particular uh, summit, especially including the dialogues that we were very much involved in at country levels. So I think that is an opportunity that we can take advantage of, especially talking from the Kenya perspective, given the, the opportunity, the school health uh, interventions that we're looking at. Great. Yeah. Okay, um, I think we have time just for maybe one question. I had seen one by David Onochie where he had addressed it to Dr. Ojo. I'm not sure if that had been answered. Uh, with regards to trade laws, um, how do we ensure that our locally produced foods get generally acceptable as opposed to the imported foods? How can the trade laws help to implement such a policy? This was for Dr. Ojo. Yes, thanks. Um, so there, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, and I don't know that we will have the time to, to do this. But I think, um, you know, maybe a couple of important things to, to mention. Our, our governments uh, need to really understand um, the dynamics of global trade, um, especially from the food perspective, and really have strategies about how we engage. Um, with that whole system. Uh, like I said, there's a lot to unpack. But I think the second part of it is actually what we do as a population, as a, um, you know, a group of uh, people who are producing and putting food on the market. Given, taking the example from Nigeria, there seems to be a complete breakdown in regards to food safety awareness um, and practice. And so, um, we can't get foods into global markets if they are not um, safe. And so the things that we get away with in, in our countries will not you know, successfully pass through global uh, quality uh, checks and systems. And so we need to really focus on 
on making our food safe and exportable uh, and, and then engage with the global system around this. Um, but finally, there's a lot of hunger here. Uh, if I was in agriculture in a country like Nigeria with 200 million people, I'll be looking to actually feed this country uh, first. We, we produce, we're big producers of many um, you know, food items, commodities, cassava, maize, rice, uh, but yet we still have gaps. And so the opportunity is there to invest and grow and produce the food locally um, before we even start thinking of export. So like I said, I, I'm, I've tried to jump around about three or four things, but there's a lot to unpack, uh, but um, there's a lot more that we need to do, uh, both as a government and as people. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. I know the questions are, are numerous and uh, we've not yet been able to address all of them. And we encourage, actually, I think one of the conversations that um, you've just packed right now with that question on trade, uh, David Onochie, I, I, I propose um, having a look at the Nutrition Conversations Africa website. Our previous webinar was about the taking advantage of the Africa um, uh, continental free trade area. And those are some of the discussions that we had on that. So that might be useful for you. And um, I also would encourage you to please, you know, send in your questions, reflections, observations, email us at info at nutritionconversationsafrica.com because we'll not be able to answer everything here. But from that um, uh, platform, we shall be able to uh, address your questions or direct them accordingly. So please email us, uh, reach us on that email. So we have three minutes to time and I would like to say a very big thank you to each one of you who has attended today for your thoughts, your contributions to the um, awesome panelists who have been here. Your input has been very valuable. Dr. Ojo for coming in to give us the opening remarks and for all the feedback that you've been able to uh, give on this webinar. We look forward to hosting you in our next webinar. And um, as uh, some often, or rather many of you have asked here in the, in the chat box, you know, how do we do this? How do we go about this? It may seem insurmountable at this time, but, you know, baby steps, one step at a time, one foot forward. And indeed, just really underscoring what Dr. Ojo said at the beginning, the solutions are in Africa. We can do it. We have uh, the capacity to do it. So it is rising above uh, all the noise of all that is not working and finding solutions that will propel us to the next stage. So with those few remarks, um, I hand over back to Wendy to give her final thoughts and then we can wrap up. Thank you, Grace. Thank you everyone for participating. Let's get, let's get um, the conversation going. Let's keep it going. But most importantly, more actions, not just conversations. The time to act is now, as Dr. Joe mentioned. This is the time change needs to be made by us, not for us. And that is what Nutrition Conversation Africa is about. So we'd like to hear from everybody, stakeholders, everybody participating, check out the website, email us, would answer the question and let's have more conversations like this. Thank you, a big thank you to all our panelists for your time and yet people attending for the engagement. We really appreciate it. Thank you and we look forward to more conversations. Bye-bye and thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.